Hi, good morning. My name is Alex Gartenfeld. I am the Artistic Director at the Institute of Contemporary Art Miami. Um, it's a pleasure on this Sunday morning, the closing day of Art Bow, um, to be the organizer of a series of panels and artist talks um, throughout this week, celebrating artists' um, creativity uh, and the galleries within Bogota uh, and far beyond. Um, we've been able to add to um, a really special year for the fair, um, uh, a wonderful kind of sense of context um, for the works, many of which are going to be on view. Um, today, this morning, we're joined by L'Oreal Beltran and Bernardo Ortiz, um, two artists, really extraordinary artists who have very different practices, both working with abstraction, but have some really kind of interesting kind of key shared history, interests in history, materiality, um, color, poetry, among many other topics. So we're going to learn about, a little bit about them today. Um, L'Oreal Beltran uh, is an artist who's working with abstraction based in Miami. Uh, L'Oreal's work has been included in a number of exhibitions in Miami and beyond at the ICA Miami, the Prez Art Museum, Diverse Works Houston, uh, the Fabric Workshop. He's had solo shows at Central Fine in Miami Beach uh, and the nonprofit Locust Projects. Uh, Beltran was a co-founder of the collective and gallery Gucci Vuitton, which was active from 2013 to 2016. Uh, a retrospective of that project was on view at ICA Miami in around 2016. Um, he also, and this will be the subject for much of our conversation today, has a really exciting um, exhibition and new body of work, which he'll be presenting at the Museum of Art and Design in Miami, uh, curated by Rina Carvajal. Um, I'm, excited for us to talk for a little bit about the history and context of his practice and where it takes us to today. Um, Bernardo Ortiz, next to him, um, thank you for joining us as well, has been featured with solo and group exhibitions around the world. He has an MA in philosophy from the University del Valle in Cali and a BFA in visual arts uh, and an associate degree in literature from the University de los Andes in Bogota. His work is in many prestigious collections worldwide, uh, including MoMA, the Tate, this is Nero's collection, Deutsche Bank, and the Cadiz collection. Ortiz was co-curator of the 7th Mercosur Biennial in Porto Alegre and the 41st Salon Nacional de Artistes in Cali. With Liliana Andrade, he has co-curated uh, the Arte Camera section of this year's fair. Now again, um, I think that we'll see a number of images from each of the artists, beginning with L'Oreal, um, and I'm excited to look at some of the shared themes specifically process, materiality, and a sense of the image. I'm gonna turn over first to L'Oreal. We have a stunning painting of his behind us to talk through some of the works that you've been um, creating for your exhibition in November in Miami. Hi, good morning. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna show you some of my latest work. Um, I, I tend to think of painting as something that you need to encounter. So it's a bit of, uh, contradiction to show it in images, uh, but I think, you know, I'm gonna show you also some of the process so that you can really grasp the material aspect of the of the work. Um, and, and they're very much about an experience. So I hope, you know, with the images, you can, you know, the work and this work can translate. Um, so this is a series of works that I've been doing by layering paint and um, in a process that takes, you know, a, a, a long period of time. You can see the detail of that painting. Um, and they, they deal with a lot of, um, they start from questions about painting. Um, so for example, this one is uh, two complementary colors on the edges and in the center where they meet, they optically mix into a neutral ground. Um, so it creates this sort of like atmosphere. So you have like, the extremes on the on the edges and then like a neutral ground on the center um, and depending on where you're standing it's also the experience that you get uh, from the piece um, and then so for example this one and and these are large works um, this one is a, a spectrum of color so it's you know every every color um, you know from yellow to purple the yellow being the lightest and purple the the darkest um, and I think of this painting almost like as a field of possibilities where all the colors are represented. Um, and then in the center, there's this like, almost like a break, right? Where the possibilities like start to emerge. Like any, any image could come out of these colors. Um, so it's almost like a dormant screen or, uh, you know, just a space for like 
possible images. You can see a close-up of that piece uh, here. And for scale reference, then there's uh, this one, um, you know, it's also going back to painting. There's a, you know, what, this is a very dark painting, almost a black painting. So I like to think of the history of, you know, black paintings in, in modernism, you know, like Malevich's Black Square or uh, Reinhardt's paintings. Uh, but they're also, um, I also think of like night landscape paintings, like, you know, like different uh, periods of history where, you know, you have night paintings. Um, so it's almost like collapsing this too. And I, I, I'm interested in getting this like very dark painting that is also very, uh, chromatic, um, that it has, you know, a color that comes back and forth. So it's a painting that both absorbs light and also emits light. I think one of the things you can't see that you see in this detail is mm -hmm. the gradations of blue and black and green, which is kind of a really important part of the work. Mm -hmm. Um, in seeing these images, I think for people who are watching at home, um, they probably kind of can't understand the materiality mm -hmm. and the process by which you make the works, which is really kind of compelling and mm -hmm. maybe a starting point. Could you walk us through a little bit the kind of very central role of mater materiality and paint in creating these works um, yeah. and how they kind of come together in the studio? Yeah, definitely. So to the studio. Um, the process is uh, I, I create molds uh, that are lined with plastic so that I can remove the, the wood structure at the end. So. Uh, I pour a layer of paint and then let it dry for a few days and then pour another layer. Uh, here, this is a new painting where I'm adding a lot of interruptions because I'm, I'm finding a lot of interest in, you know, there's this very like almost codified pattern of color and, uh, you know, the planning and then all these things that kind of break it, uh, it start to like open up opportunities. Um, but essentially it's a layering process. So the drying of the paint creates cracking and the, you know, the paint is a liquid that turns into a solid. So gravity also plays a, a, a part. So, you know, if the trace a little to one side or to the other side, the paint will pull in different sections. So that part of the, you know, that material aspect gets recorded into the work. Um, and I purposely don't level my tables or anything. I mean, I try to make the process very like, um, just open and like experimental. And then once I have a block of paint, uh, that's finished. I, you know, I open it up, set it up in the machine. I had a, a machine custom built to be able to cut the blocks uh, and to reveal the cross section of of the work. So they they start, you know, they start as a, as an object that then gets sliced, and so you see the flat version of this object. So th they are very material when you see them in person. This is a video of the machine. Like ham. Yeah. And you really get a sense in this video in particular because it's time-based of the importance of time in creating this work and mm -hmm. in your process. Yeah. Um, drying time, mm -hmm. application time, mm -hmm. um, all of which kind of are built into the mechanism that for mm -hmm. creating the painting. Yeah, and I, I think time is very important too in the reception of the work. Like when you see it, I want you to be able to spend time looking at it. You know, there's there's always, the, there's so many variations and details that you can like, that I, I also want the viewer to be able to spend time looking at the object. Um, and then, you know, I put the material in trace and then I make stretchers, glue the work. So that's, that's pretty much the process um, of these paintings. Um, I wanted to rope in Bernardo a bit because I think this idea of creation every day, Bernardo, you with a kind of a lifetime drawing process from which artworks um, kind of emerge within the scope of exhibitions or not, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of your relationship to time and your process in the studio. Um, we're looking at a kind of a quite structured um, process um, that L'Oreal has created. What are the kind of working methods that you're kind of working with today? Well, I, I, um, 
I find it very interesting to contrast the, like the two practices between L'Oreal's and mine, because I've all, always, I'm, I'm a little bit neurotic. So I've set up my studio as a one person operation and it's more, more artisanal in some, some sort of way. Uh, but at the same time, this uh, idea of, of, for example, of paint drying, of surface, of process is also very, very important. Um, perhaps I, I, I could talk about this thing that happened to me for a long time, and it's an ongoing thing that I've been doing for almost 25 years as a piece. I, I got paid when I was in college for some kind of work I did with 50 sheets of Fabriano paper. And at that time, it was a very mm, precious material that I had. <clears throat> and I didn't know what to do. To do. I, I didn't know what to do with that because I felt that it was very precious and I couldn't use it in something that was worthy of that paper. So I let it, uh, I, I had it in, in, with me for almost 10 years. And 10 years later, I thought, now I'm ready to use the paper. But <laughs> when I opened up the box with the paper, it was all full of mold and fungus. <laughs> so for the last uh, 15 years, I've been uh, tracing around and, and having like a tracing, uh, tracing around the, the fungus and the mold as it has been growing. And I paint the paper white and just leave the, the specks of mold. But then the next year, new specks of mold appear. And, also, and so I have to paint white again. And it's a very, very long process for a work that, that I, I've never shown. I, I just showed uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in Buenos Aires, a fragment of the work, but it has never been shown. And I like these kind of processes also that are very, in a way, invisible to the, to the viewer, but also very present. I, I think one of the great, uh, qualities of visuality in painting and in drawing, in my case, is that uh, it deals also with invisibleness. And we used to talk about invisibleness as something that was kind of mystified or mystical, but I think it's very literal also. I, I don't deny the mystifying part and I quite like it, but I, I feel that, that it has a, a, a footing in the materiality of the work. And if you see in L'Oreal's painting, you, you see that uh, there is, he's showing us all, all, everything that is under the layers of paint. It's like a geological cross-section of what paint is, and it's revealing what it, you cannot see. And that kind of thing is also uh, very important to me. I love what you say in terms of origin stories, and it reminds me of two kind of elements that I've been thinking about in my recent conversation with L'Oreal and mm -hmm. please excuse me L'Oreal because I'm probably taking this way out of order but one of the things one of the kind of important for me effects of kind of L'Oreal's work in this working process is this kind of idea of excess material and in fact one of the images that you've described L'Oreal to me <coughs> is this idea of uh, an easel or I'm sorry a, a, a working kind of a painter's are you using that? Palette, thank you. A palette kind of consumed by extra paint. And it actually, for me, almost, I had a mental image, which I didn't even mention to you, of like something almost like mold like kind of growing up out of the palette, which yeah. was a very kind of interesting reference because there is so much order to the work. Mm -hmm. I, I think both of those ideas perfectly lead to this uh, <laughs> other project that I wanted to share with you, which was at Locus Projects in 2009. Uh, what you were mentioning of uh, invisibility, that was very much about you know what this project was about. Um, so this was a this this space. It, Locus Projects is a nonprofit um, space in Miami, and they had this space for ten years. This was their first location. So the paint in the walls had accumulated from you know people painting the gallery a different color, and then painting it white, and then you know painting a mural, and then painting it white. Um, so I proposed to remove the paint from the walls and then cut it in cross sections in the same way that I, I make the other works at the studio. And then present the works on top of the walls that were completely stripped of paint. Uh, and what this revealed was like every hole that was 
opened in the in the gallery. So you know it's hard to see here, but you know when you approach it, the walls were just destroyed. I mean everything that was installed there is there was a register. Uh, all the labor of the paint of you know people painting the walls was registered there. I mean a, a lot of people came to the show and were looking for the layers of their show. Um, you know so this became like a like a way of making visible you know uh, a, a lot of different things you know one was the labor of you know painting uh, and also the idea of keeping the white cube effect uh, you know the, the the gallery walls always have to be pristine and and, and clean and uh, you know so so I, I also thought of labor and the idea that good labor is always invisible like if you see a job then it's probably because it's badly made and that's why it's visible to you um, so I think in the in terms of like gallery walls that was a perfect uh, like metaphor for it. Um, so you see like holes that were dug and, you know, just different things. To me, this installation um, really encompasses a lot of the ideas that you're still working with today. And it also, the first thing that strikes me just to look at this photograph is that it takes really on the language of um, institutional critique and kind of the aesthetic of institutional critique within the image, especially with these kind of stripped away walls, uh -huh. which is again, something that's, I think has played out in a number of ways, perhaps in each of your work. And Bernardo, I, I think I know less of the, about specifically your relationship to institutional critique, but definitely an ongoing relationship to architecture uh -huh. and the architecture of the gallery. Yeah. Um, and specifically, I think in both of your works, um, in attention to the support, the, the space uh -huh. kind of, um, the space of the material and its relationship to the environment. Perhaps, Bernardo, you could begin, I, mean, I know that's kind of a general comment, but speak a little bit about kind of the role of the support in your work and also how it strikes you in L'Oreal's as well. Well, uh, because my work is mostly paper-based, uh, <clears throat> support is very important. I've always, I'm, I'm always very weary of, of molding, uh, Framing, I, I, I guess it's the, the right word, framing of, of my work. Because I feel that um, the work, if you are going to have an exhibition, and in Spanish we say exposición, which is the word for exhibition, and it also means to be exposed. And so I feel that the work has always uh, needs to be exposed uh, for it to be, well, be offered to, to someone to see it. I feel that it's a very stingy in a way to uh, frame the work and not let it be exposed to the same air that everybody is breathing. So if, if, I, if I may uh, show some of oh, uh, an image. Um, Sorry for this. Okay. So, for example, in this work that I that I that I did, this is um, this is a a twenty five meter long uh, work that I did in in Denver in the Museum of Contemporary Art, and it. The, uh, the fall, and it also has to do with the institutional critique. I did all the mathematical calculations to, to verify or certify a Bitcoin operation, but I did it by hand uh, just to expose the, again, this notion of, of uh, digitality has this notion of transparency and invisibility, when in fact it's quite opaque. The digital image and the digital operations always are uh, a wall of numbers. And so I did this whole thing, uh, which was very time consuming. It was like two months of work that I had to do it all by hand. Um, and the way that the work is placed on the gallery is with these uh, little bits of strips of paper that are glued to the wall. And then the paper that, the, the, that supports all the operations goes uh, on the, the, the strips of paper go through the the drawing itself. So it's like two works, one that supports the other because these are uh, little bits of uh, poems that are derived from 
eh, o libro do desasosego de from Fernando Pessoa. And uh, if you know the book, he was an accountant and he loved the idea of just uh, uh, writing numbers on paper. So the, this this idea of um, of the support being very fragile and very uh, thin. It's also a way of getting into the materiality of the work in, in a very different way. And this has to do, I think, a little bit with institutional critique in the sense that uh, all the structure of the way that art is uh, circulating now is digital. And this idea that the digital world gives us of transparency, immediacy, is uh, uh, but an illusion. And uh, this again brought up kind of two two ideas for me in terms of connecting to L'Oreal's work. The first, with these kind of staggered alphanumerical poems, was the kind of interruptions that you've included in your work. So, to defer to the images that we saw before in these kind of semi-abstract fields of color, um, the stutters are caused by um, fragments of words, language, plastic, ultimately plastic letters, I'm assuming for children or something, yeah. um, that you inserted into the machine to create um, interruptions into the abstract field. Could you talk a little bit about kind of that process or a relationship to the written word and poetry as it manifests in a suppressed way through these works? I, I think the way that I've been thinking about it um, and in relationship to what he was saying, I mean, I, I think of code, uh, mostly as it relates to DNA, but clearly, you know, the idea you were describing, it's based on the code that it's, uh, so, I mean, code could be many things, right? It could be, you know, language, or it could be, you know, um, you know, computer code or DNA or, um, so in a way I think of my, the way I set up my works is I start with, you know, a certain code, right? Like, okay, primary colors, you know, two layers per color, uh, you know, when I repeat it this many times, uh, and then in the, from the idea to the application to the process to the creation of it that's when you know these like sort of mutations start to happen you know and then uh so before those interruptions were just because of the materiality of the paint uh but now i'm looking to you know highlight that in terms of uh almost seeing the paintings as a as a field of possibilities you know and then the interruptions are the possibilities that emerge in this field. Um, so I think that's kind of where they are at the moment. The second notion that Bernardo's comment sort of brought up for me was this idea, and again, deferring to this picture, which I think is a great one, that the process that you're using began with actual kind of artifactual layers of paint. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently you've developed a process by which you're turning those into images. So mm -hmm. they're almost, reproductions of these naturally occurring mm -hmm. paintings. And I thought maybe perhaps you could tell us a little about, about your thinking on that as well. And I have a feeling there's a relationship in there in terms of the relationship of material to image within Bernardo's practice as well. Mm -hmm. So these, I, I started layering paint at the studio before I did this, but before it was more, uh, it wasn't about color, they weren't very specific. Uh, they were more about creating this like accumulation and this like literal ground, you know. Um, I, I felt a little disconnected when I first moved to Miami with, you know, culturally. So I, to me, like just this process of layering paint and this repetition really became uh, just a way of feeling like I was grounded. Um, but a lot of the work was received as like, as if I was trying to replicate nature because they were just kind of like the colors that I found in dumpsters and you know, they, they weren't very specific. Uh, but then after this idea, I guess this really changed, you know, and like my thinking and the way that I, you know, I could approach it. Um, and it, it also like gave a lot of depth with, you know, ideas of like labor and like, you know, like, you, you know, work, you know, artistic work versus paid work or, um, you know, a lot of ideas that I find interesting. Um, and in terms of, you know, images, I think, you know, we have, I think we're both interested in images, but I think we're interested in images in slightly different ways. Um, I like to think of images as like, almost like language, you know, like images are contained and digestible, uh, right? Like you go through Instagram or you see a billboard or, you know, images are meant to be like cohesive and like one. 
Um, and you, you talk of images about being this, the, deceiving, which I agree, uh, but I kind of just, you know, I, I, I just like to think of the image, the difference between like an image and a painting. Uh, and I think a painting should be uh, more of an object to like contemplate and study and walk around. And, you know, like it requires you to be present and to be thinking and to be like active in the looking. Uh, so in a way, I think it's like opposite to what images do, which is, you know, and especially a lot of these works that are just very, um, you know, they just kind of fall apart and come together depending on the distance, depending on how you're looking at them. Um, so to me, they're almost like anti-image, you know, I mean, there are things that start to happen, but they don't really have a certain form. Um, you know, they're just very much like negating the, like what images do. Uh, well, yeah, I agree very much. And, uh, with, <clears throat> with that notion of image that you're, um, proposing, uh, because I, I think, uh, I think there, there's a problem also in the way that we talk about images nowadays, because we, we still use the, the words that were established around images in the 16th and 17th century with the emergence of optics. And so we have all these words like objective, uh, transparency, words like that, that, that emerge from optics. But now we are in a post-optical image and this will require a completely new uh, language if we are going to acknowledge the fact that images are not transparent and are not objective. Uh, for example, one of the seminal works about the photographic image, like uh, this notion of index that Rosalind Krauss advanced in the 70s, uh, is no longer valid in a way because the images what we are seeing are increasingly uh, distant from the optical, uh, even more now that uh, the optical sensors in digital cameras are enhanced with artificial intelligence to create uh, very specific ways in which photography has to emerge. So to me, that's a, that's a terrible problem. And uh, th there are these works that I've done, uh, which are digital. Uh, I'm going to show So these are, uh, it, it's very difficult to show them in a screen. They are meant to be printed. And these are images of, of um, static uh, television screens. But then I, I've been filtering them through uh, very obsolete software from the 70s that um, <clears throat> makes images through numbers. And also uh, using the, the way that the uh, the printed image is layered in in three colors in four colors I'm sorry uh, cyan magenta yellow and black and creating these green tinted things that are also fields for accident and also there are ways of of inserting uh, little bits of poetry <laughs> and so they're kind of static poetry uh, that goes there. Uh, so I, I like this, this idea of, of the image as a, of the image as a field that can be recomposed incessantly. And I think uh, once we understand this, we would, we, we will strip the image from this condition of veracity that has been also very, very damaging for political reasons in the last five or six years. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, painting and drawing can also be very much of this time in the sense that it, they can offer a new critique on the image and a new and 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 reconnect us to very basic ways of of experiencing the visual it's striking to me bernardo well first it's striking to me an interesting comparison contrast with l'oreal's works just looking as you zoom in on these images so thank you for that but also um, that as you speak about the present and the short term future, I'm actually quite reminded of um, certain artistic histories and legacies and specifically um, we used as the title of this talk, the term neo concrete, although we've sort of discarded it subsequently, which I feel very comfortable with. That said, 
kind of, I think, and L'Oreal has actually said to me in some of our conversations that he's found, actually in our email conversation, to which your response was, oh no, which I loved. But um, L'Oreal talked about finding kind of a, a, a secure space, kind of a, a, a lacuna within um, the notion of the neo-concrete, um, as opposed to kinetic or optical, because many, many of L'Oreal's works do that and ascribe to those traditions or relate to those traditions, but that the notion of the neo-concrete, because it rel relates both to the image and a more phenomenal phenomenological kind of um, suggestion of movement and objectness, that he could balance those two things within the image seems key to understanding this particular work as well as both, as well as L'Oreal's paintings. L'Oreal, I know that you have a very specific relationship to this tradition in history. Maybe you could walk us through it a little bit as, as, as we think about some of your works. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't usually like labels, but people love to throw labels at you know, work. Um, and since I'm Venezuelan and my work, at least for now, you know, this type of work has an optical element. They, they immediately tell me, you know, I'm making up art or, you know, kinetic art. And there's definitely a relation to the history. I mean, obviously Cruz Diez is, you know, a huge uh, influence of my work and Soto. Uh, but I also find that I need to differentiate myself from them because I don't, I don't agree with a lot of like, you know, the certainty and the, you know, universalism and, you know, that sort of like utopian modernist ideals that they were so like enthusiastic about. Um, so in a way I found that, you know, the neo-concrete practices of Brazil, Venezuela and Argentina, you know, if people want to put a label, I think it's, I, I rather start there because those practices I feel relate a lot more to what I'm trying to do. And, uh, you know, this idea of, the object creating itself, you know, every time you approach it, or you know, these ideas of phenomenology, and um, even the, the the term concrete, I prefer to abstraction because I think abstraction is something that relates to the world, even if it's non-representational. Whereas uh, concrete, it's concrete. It's like it is what it is, right? So I mean, and in this case, it's very obviously an object that has been sliced. So it's. I, I wouldn't necessarily call them abstractions. Um, so in that sense, uh, you know, I, I sort of welcome the, you know, if somebody wants to put a label, I welcome the neo-concrete better than, um, than, you know, optical art or, or you know, kinetic art. Um, well, I think you're also kind of interpreting this um, notion of the image and its materiality or its material components through ideas of media and the urban environment and particular early works of yours that come to mind for me mm -hmm. i think they're probably way down in the presentation yeah. are photo collages that you made um i think you have an image prepared of a almost kind of post-situationist um kind of day tournament image of uh, a fashion illustration from a bus stop which you took and applied paint to mm -hmm. um, with a sense of revision and critique of the image, but also as a way of perhaps transcending that image as well, because mm -hmm. there are the strategies that you're using are compositional as well. I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of your thinking on this particular body of work and your relationship to the compositional images, which it's hard to kind of unsee when you see some of your later work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, with these, I was, uh, you know, Miami is a very strange place where very little history or the history is not very well recorded. So uh, I, I feel, you know, so much art is just based on context and like, you know, what other art has been made around you and what history there is. Um, and for a while I struggled to find like, you know, what was my place, you know, as an artist in Miami and where could I start, you know, painting. Um, and like, I kept looking at the bus shelter images, you know, when, when people wait for the bus, there's an ad that's backlit. Um, and I started thinking that, you know, these were flat and shiny and transient, and these were very much the images of Miami and like kind of like the aesthetic where I could start to engage with the city. Um, so I started stealing the bus shelter posters because I wanted the material aspect of them. Um, and then I started simplifying the compositions because I guess that's the same way we were talking about images. I mean, these images are very specific. You know, this is a Bacardi ad. So they're selling you a bottle of rum. 
uh, you know, and the image is kind of like this like uh, pre-revolution Cuba, which is, you know, like a very popular idea in Miami, you know, uh, Cuba before the revolution. Uh, and it also had this very like geometric abstraction kind of composition. Um, so in a way, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, like turn the specific into the timeless and also like kind of bring the essence of what this image is really made of. So the image is really referencing a certain period in our history um, that is connected, you know, to a lot of the history of like the Cuban uh, geometric abstraction and, you know, in a, a lot of Latin American abstraction in general. So, and, and so this works really became a way for me to practice, you know, painting on top of images uh, and sort of explore a lot of ideas of painting and our history through images that were being produced and they're very highly produced and very expensive to make. I mean, I almost think of the Renaissance studio, you know, thinking of the people who are producing these images, you have photographers and lighting and makeup and, you know, so there's like this like production quality that I was also sort of tagging onto, you know, by using these images. So uh, I'll show you a few more examples. Um, so here on the left, this one is like a very 18th century type of palette. Um, and then the other one is like a very like gestural and like bravado sort of gesture. And it's like a manly image and the, you know, it's like a man with a suit. Um, um, you know, this one's very much uh, like a chiaroscuro. And then, you know, this one's a little different because the perfume ads were so much more about sex. I mean, like, the, you know, it's almost like the, you're, they're selling you pheromones so that you're like sexy and attractive. Um, so I really like this image almost as like a fertility figure. So I like that it has this sort of like, um, like old quality and like almost like stone, like almost like a Venus of, uh, you know, like the Venus of Willendorf or, or these like, you know, objects that we think of as fertility figures. And um, these images in particular, I thought of them because Bernardo, you were speaking about, for instance, the Rosalind Krauss's definition of the true image through the index. Um, and L'Oreal's practice almost takes for granted that they are not true. Um, you know, you spoke in, and I, you used in some of our correspondences, uh, the example of artificial intelligence machines, which automatically improve images or improve photographs or improve data that's inherent to our face. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how kind of photography or images um, and source images play into your work, if at all, which is so grounded in sort of true abstraction. Yeah, well, I have a very traumatic relationship with, with photograph, with photographic uh, images because uh, I really, uh, when, when, when I was little, my, my father was an amateur photographer and he was always taking pictures. And I hated the way that pictures interrupted uh, life. We had to stand before a building and be, be photographed. And we were enjoying the three-dimensionality of the place that we were in. And we had to stop everything to take an image. And I think that, uh, that anecdote from my childhood is very much at play today all the time uh, in, in a very, very insistent way. We see people photographing themselves and everything all the time, experiencing the world through these uh, very small screens that are always interrupting like, the flow of, of, of life. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, I guess I, 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 I think it's very interesting what, what this opens up because the more we go into this post digital post optic i'm sorry post optical uh notion of image uh the truthfulness the this uh tradition that started with the veronica which is the true image uh in the 16th century will be eventually abandoned and everybody will realize that all images are uh, are not necessarily grounded in reality. Uh, I guess uh, there will be ways and mechanisms that will appear for uh, something to be certified as an image that is just an optical impression of light, but we are very far from that now. Um, and 
what I find fascinating is that uh, all technologies, all and, and I'm including painting and drawing as a technology, all technologies have the uh, option of criticizing this notion of the image. So when 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 you said that. Uh, you prefer the label neo concrete, and we had all this email discussion about that. Um, <clears throat> and I said, "Oh no, it was because I, I think that uh, art history, our art historical categor categories, are very uh, they enact a kind of a taming of the work. It will neatly categorize the work." and stop the work from spilling over to other things. So when we're seeing these uh, uh, works by, by L'Oriel, in which he uses uh, a very obsolete technology as painting and uses the palette of 18th century painting to critique a 21st century image, is very interesting because it kind of does away with these uh, world uh, periods that are always uh, enacted by art history and gives these obsolete technologies the power to have a, a new critical value in, in talking about uh, visuality. And I, I, I think it's very useful and very important for, for artists to, to, in a way, reclaim that space that art history has kind of stripped away from them because uh, neatly categorizes as something that you should do in the 21st century, something that you should do in the 20th century, something that you should do in the 19th century. But then there is a, a critical vocabulary that is uh, kind of embodied in this, in this work. And I think that's very important. I think continuous is what you're saying in terms of resisting some of the, say, conservative orthodoxies of um, historic, historicizing artists. Um, interdisciplinarity, hybridity within the work is something each of you have taken on to certain magnitudes. And I think within L'Oreal's practice, um, it's been interesting for me uh, living and working in Miami as well, but obviously from a quite a, a different context, a different um, tradition, um, to see some of his painting photo and post photographic practices uh, move into the space of curatorial as well as social engagement and with a keen eye to the extent to which images, advertising, commerce, and the appropriation of art historical images are being currently used within the city that we both live to glamorize, catalyze, and in many ways foment um, investment. And now I say all that to kind of bring us toward um, the curatorial project which L'Oreal undertook with three other artist architects, Jonathan Gonzalez, Hermes Gutierrez, and Domingo Castillo from 2013 to 2016. Um, the name, and this is the first of a number of names because I believe you had some copyright issues yes. once you got too popular. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think the name certainly suggests a lot of the intentionality of the project, mm -hmm. which was to both highlight uh, what are kind of dominant image practices used through luxury advertising, mm -hmm. and then ground them in a very kind of um, material sense of the local and your space within Little Haiti and within Miami. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you could share with us some of the projects as well as how they connect to your artistic practice as well. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, it's, you know, Gucci Vuitton, it's obviously an awful name, but it was the name that made perfect sense for Miami. You know, it's cheap and it's, you know, aspirational and it's uh, luxury, but, you know, like, you know, Miami, it's, it's, it's a young city, you know, and, and I love Miami, you know, but I'm also critical of, uh, you know, a lot of the things. And, um, yeah, there's been a lot of just global capital moving into the city and there's been a lot of tension between, you know, that global sort of... Uh, movement and the people who just live there, you know, uh, in terms of pricing and, you know, of, of housing and gentrification and et cetera. Um, so we decided to open this also as a way to engage with uh, the aesthetics of Miami and like the history and a context. I mean, what I was saying earlier of, you know, artists need a context and Miami just, it's very hard to find your place. So I think this was a way for us to um, create that context. Um, so we did shows that were 
maybe not what you would expect in a, well, some of them. So for example, this is a, we call the Florida landscape painting show, which contemporary galleries would probably not do a landscape painting show. Uh, but we took some artists, you know, from who are called, it's a group of artists who are called the highwaymen. Um, they started working in the 50s and they were all African-American and they, the loss of, you know, Florida, the South were um, extremely difficult, you know, for them to find work, uh, except for like the fields or very hard work. Uh, and one of them learned how to paint and he started teaching his cousins. So they started selling the work on the side of the highway to the tourists who were coming from the north. Um, and they created this really amazing style uh, of like very quick painting, but very realistic. And it's kind of what you would expect of, you know, a Florida painting. So we sort of contextualized the show with this, you know, a few of these artists uh, with a few of other artists that we knew who are aware of contemporary art and were either taking the landscape painting as a protest against what they were seeing or uh, some of them were using it for, um, you know, thinking about like ecological issues. And, you know, so we sort of had this uh, mix of, you know, context of what landscape painting had been and, you know, the people who were practicing this sort of like taboo medium um, and presenting it in, you know, in the context of this gallery called Gucci Bhutan, which is, you know, sounds like high luxury, but it's, you know, presenting a landscape painting show. Um, I really like this show as well. This is a uh, Purvis Young. He, he's a painter who has always been presented more as like a mythical figure because he was homeless for most of his life. Um, so he used to make a lot of paintings, you know, on doors and, you know, any material that he would encounter. So we felt that like a lot of the people presenting his work were presenting him as a figure or as a character rather than like focusing on his work and his content. Um, and his work is very strong. Uh, and this was at the time where the Black Lives Matter movement was starting. Um, and he had painted a lot of different scenes of protests, like from the Vietnam War era, the civil rights era, um, the McDuffie riots. Um, so we thought it would be interesting to sort of pull this work, you know, and like curate a show of, you know, this sort of uh, theme right like it's like another cycle of the same thing you know like and and this was before uh i mean this was 2015 this was you know trevor martin michael brown tamir rice you know it wasn't george floyd yet uh but it's still you know it's this cyclical thing that just keeps happening in the u.s so we thought it would be interesting to present it through the eyes of somebody who had like painted it um in a different time in a different moment um but it's still the same idea this is a crowd being watched over by blue eyes, you know, for example. So there's like this idea of like racial tension and, you know, a lot of interesting things we did. So as Alex mentioned, the gallery was located in Little Haiti, uh, which is obviously a, you know, very, a lot of Haitian, um, you know, population in the neighborhood. Uh, so we have a friend who has a, a gallery in Port-au-Prince and he has a lot of work from old Haitian artists and contemporary Haitian artists. So we worked with him to curate a show of, you know, I guess following a similar uh, path from the landscape painting show. So we had historical works with works made, made in Miami uh, about Haiti, not necessarily they, all the artists were in Haitian. Um, and also, you know, people in, in, in the island who were producing work. So we sort of like put them all together. Um, and also a lot of the way I've seen the traditional Haitian work presented is presented in a very specific way. And we presented it in a contemporary art um, sort of setting, you know? So it, it was a way of connecting to the work through the way we're, at least in the contemporary community, in the way that we were used to seeing art or curating the art. And then Alex approaches to, you know, do a show at the museum. And this was the, the temporary space uh, before they got their uh, permanent building. Uh, and it's an atrium that has, you know, four stories. Um, and the museum is located in the design district, which is a very, very luxury type of place. Actually, you know, once we set foot in the design district is when the cease and desist letters started to show up about the name. Um, you know, because people would come and ask if this was like 
you know, Gucci and Louis Vuitton making a collaboration. I mean, people were so excited and then so disappointed to learn it was an art exhibition. Um, but I, I, I think this in the context of institutional critique, like it, it worked really well because it was this collapsing of like the global, right? And this like luxury brands with our appropriation and this like notion of like the local and the context of a place. Um, so we decided to show our inventory uh, or unsold inventory because we operated as a gallery uh, and we barely sold anything. So we pretty much had everything we had shown. <laughs> so it was also a matter of like, turning the inventory into the, turning the retrospective into the inventory. Um, so, and, and the way you see the works in the atrium is through windows. Um, so it gave you this experience of like window shopping. Um, so it sort of turned the museum into a store. Uh, not necessarily, but it gave that idea, uh, which to us was really interesting of, you know, kind of seeing the museum as like an anchor of luxury you know so it's a way of exploring you know that idea or you know um yeah and you you could also see the back of the works and so the pieces were both like presented in a you know in a frontal way but you could also see the materiality of the works in the way that they were installed so i don't know if you want to say anything about that show alex no, I mean, I think that we were so drawn to it because, um, as you say, institutionally, there is a relationship which is very potent between the museum and its immediate context. Um, and it's one that no one person can solve or one board can solve. So the idea to bring together a, a number of artists whose work was firmly rooted in the community and constituencies of Miami was an interesting way of um, dealing with some of this set of problems. I also want to mention as we um, kind of review some of these images that when you, there's been a long kind of perhaps two decade um, discourse on incorporating self-taught artists into traditional canons, but this uh, a lot of this had not happened until 2013. I mean, a lot of the works that you're showing were lent to the last documenta in terms of the Haitian works. Um, so there is an element of this coming before in a quite transgressive way in terms of revisiting the canon and the way that it, it kind of relates to Miami. And I'm particularly drawn to the context of living there, of course, because um, it brings together and reverses so many traditions which are extant in other places. Mm -hmm. I think, Bernardo, unless you have any further questions, that might be a good place to have brought everything full circle. Um, I don't believe that we can take questions because I think, I don't know if they're popping up online. So I think I will conclude just by thanking L'Oreal and thanking Bernardo, thanking you for um, the generosity of sharing your practices and also finding kind of common spaces within the practices. Um, I hope that it's the beginning of a lot of interesting dialogue and I thank you both for participating in the Art Boat program. So thank you so much, congratulations. Yeah. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, Great to be here.